Okay. Hey, everybody. This is an awesome turnout. I'm glad uh, this many people can make it out. I was expecting like maybe 10 or 20, so um, I'm uh, very happy to see all of you here. Very uh, nice to be in, in uh, Antwerp as well. Um, so this talk is going to be about HTML5 and JavaScript web apps. So I've got this book here with the same title. There's no relationship whatsoever. Um, so uh, at the end, I'm going to hand out a few, however you guys want to want to come get them. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, let's see. So we've got slides here. So we've got three hours to learn cool shit like everything related to HTML5 and the mobile web. So we've got three hours here. So I'm going to try to go over the essentials and the basics of HTML5, what it takes to run on both, both mobile and desktop browsers, and how you can kind of defragment um, HTML5 because there's so much fragmentation. And so how you can build a usable app across all these platforms with the cool HTML5 APIs. So like I said, just wrote a book for O'Reilly. Um, I've spent the last 10 years on the UI. I worked um, this year alone, I've had four different jobs. So I've worked for JBoss for about four years. Left there because as I was writing my book, I was finding out that I was kind of out of touch with, with what developers were really facing in, in the front lines in, in corporate environments, corporate IT. So I wanted to get back in the trenches, start consulting again, and see, you know, how are these companies using HTML5? You know, how can, how can HTML5 be put into place? in the real world when you're dealing with older browsers like IE7. So I've been to Cox, CNN, and, and now I work for a company in Palo Alto called Apogee. Um, and like I said, love the UI. So the first hour, we're going to talk about the browser as a platform. We're going to look at some numbers, and then we're going to write an offline web app. Now, if you don't have your laptop out, that's fine. I'm going to go, over, go through the code step by step. So the web browser is now the platform. Um, in the past, you know, we've, we've looked at the platform as, as middleware or heavy backend, and then you know, pumping all this, this markup and all these resources out to the browser. Now we have quite a few different vendors coming in, into play to where you know, there's more front-end code, um, and, and that front-end code is considered just as much as the back-end, if not more, now, because we have things like JavaScript on the server, where you know, we're running um, Node.js or whatever, and we're doing all these, these new and interesting things. But with those new things comes things like security, and, and you're rebuilding a stack from scratch. So, um, and, and you have all the same problems that you have with JavaScript. So knowing kind of how the balance is going to come in, in this era that we're living in, like you know, we're going from heavy middleware to all the code on the front end, and then trying to find a balance here. So um, as things pan out, we'll, we'll see that, you know, that which one's better, NIO versus threading. Um, you know, overall, you're writing uh, single threaded event loops where the callbacks um, and blocking must be managed. So we're not going to get into that holy war. Uh, for this talk, we're going to talk about HTML5 and mobile web apps um, and making those applications capable for offline. So the mobile web. So HTML5 is mostly about mobile, right? Um, Apple really did a big push when they released the iPhone and really embraced HTML5, and that kind of brought forth a new era of markup for mobile devices. Um, and then we have this, the Android competition now as well. So it's constantly Android's outselling iOS or iPhone devices, and and you know where are these devices being sold? In which region? Which country? Right now, Android's outselling uh, iPhone four to one, but those numbers are mostly coming from China. So um, it's, it's really about understanding your audience, understanding what platforms you want to try to tackle, and you know go from that approach. So mobile development comes first, and everything follows. But sometimes being first isn't. Um, what you want. You, you think you're going into attack and, and you know, you're getting attacked. So um, this is a lesson that's, that's been hard won by developers like myself who've 
implemented HTML5 solutions and try to get as close to native as possible. And that's what we're going to do today. I'm, I'm going to show you with like 100 lines of JavaScript, well, maybe 50, 100 lines of CSS, and overall close to 250, 300 lines to get a native feeling mobile web app. Oops. So, native versus mobile. Um, right now, you know, the big debate, native versus mobile, um, there's mostly that has to do with hardware lockout because you cannot access some of those APIs through a HTML5 capable browser. And native is not for everybody, especially for the big companies that don't want to invest in a, um, in a developer team for every, every uh, platform out there, so every native platform. So, you know, when I was working for CNN, it was, you know, they were attacking the mobile web because that was, you know, they didn't have the resources or time to put into a native app. Um, so that effort gets a lot more um, attention, I think, and even in Facebook's case, you know, uh, they, they've even come out and said it, it's, it really depends on your uses. Yeah, it, Facebook came out and said HTML5 is not that great, and we can't use it, and we're going to write native. But the majority of their hits come from the mobile web, regardless if they use a native app or not. So it's very important. So there is hope. So Apple had an advantage. They had an operating system, right? That's how this whole mobile, re mobile revolution started. They, they had Next, which was kind of the, the precursor to OS X and then iOS, and now they have Objective-C, and that, that gave them a, a very powerful platform to launch native, to launch their app store that collects 40% off the top of each sale. And so then we had Android, and you know, with Google backing them, and they're kind of the first competitor to iOS, they have a lot of market share now, they're an open platform, and that makes it even better. So that's great, we have an open platform, but it's still native. Well. So Mozilla is stepping in, and, and you know, back when Firefox was around version 3, they really tried to disrupt Internet Explorer and say, okay, we've got a new browser on the market, i.e. is not the big player anymore, um, even though it still kind of was percentage-wise. Um, so now they're, they're saying, okay, we've got to step into the mobile game. So they're coming out with this HTML5-based operating system, and we're going to go over that in a bit. But so... You know, you've got, if you look at the history of, of how the mobile revolution has happened, you know, you have iOS who came in, then you got Android, now you got an HTML5 based OS. So the whole native versus mobile debate can, is, is really, it can't be debated. It, it really depends on, on the, use, the use case and, you know, what, what you're trying to do with the app. So in 2013, it's predicted that there will be 1 billion HTML5 capable devices sold. And this chart here kind of shows, this is from earlier this year. So we have uh, mobile Safari at 63% and Android at 18, and then Opera Mini up top and then all the others. And you'll see in a moment, as I said, this was from May. So running those numbers again today, you'll see a huge difference in how the market is, is um, growing and shrinking for these browsers. So as I said earlier, everything is, is very fragmented. Um, this chart shows the, the largest part of the pie here is, is gingerbread, and that's Android 2.3, 2.32. And if you've ever done any mobile web development, you know how much of a pain it is to deal with Android 2.3 devices. Um, the the 4.0, the ice cream sandwich, uh, capable devices are much better to deal with. But as, as you'll see as we go through the code, um, that you know, the fragmentation and, and, and trying to handle, yeah, Android handles this, iOS does this, and, and balancing those things out is very important. So one thing that, that we're having to understand today in this environment is that web applications are not going to work the same across all browsers. They're not going to be pixel perfect across IE6, 7, all the way up to Chrome 20, Canary, whatever. So that's something that, that businesses have a really hard time understanding is that, you know, uh, the product team or whoever wants everything to look exactly the same. And 
one thing we should push for as developers is to say, is to push back and say, hey, look, you know, we're going to have this new thing to where the newer modern browsers get the cool stuff and then the older ones get the, the functionality required to, to function, but, you know, things don't have to look the same anymore. It's, it's, it's a different game now. So mobile first. So mobile first, to me, is also equal to offline first. And what that means is to have an offline capable app, right? So you've got, um, you've got a mobile device, you've got all your JavaScript code, HTML, CSS on that device. Um, and that application can have limited connectivity to the server. So that is basically offline first, is, is developing your apps to be offline, right? So with that, in that same thread is, is also this term called progressive enhancement or responsive design and all these cool new uh, buzzwords. But what does, what does this approach actually give us? It allows us to, to create content, more fluid and flexible content for these devices. And um, a guy named Brad Frost has did a study on the two US presidential candidates, Romney and Obama. And what he found was that both of them implemented two different mobile strategies. And let me see if I can enlarge this, because that's kind of small. So what, what Romney did was they, their team kind of said, you know, these, these, these are the functions required to navigate this site. They put them up front and gave it a separate, like, m.romney.com domain. Obama's team despite, decided to go the responsive approach where all the content was kind of um, uh, rearranged so that, so that the user could navigate. But the problem was, with that is you have this wild goose chase of all the original content from the main desktop website. I mean, you're looking at this huge list of content, you're scrolling through it and trying to navigate around. So with responsive design, you, you really have to kind of play it smart as to how you organize your content, how your content's delivered, and all that affects, you know, kind of how you touch the back end and the server and JSON is delivered down to the client. So it's really un, un, uh, important to understand how this, this thing works. So, so yeah, so when we're developing for newer hardware, we have things like the geolocation uh, capabilities. We've got the accelerometer, um, augmented reality. I don't know if anyone's seen what augmented reality does, but it's kind of where you hold up your phone and it shows the different things on the screen, like where the restaurant ratings are and, and those types of things. So Google Glass. It's augmented reality. Um, so, and then you have touch screens, which give users new ways of interacting with your content. It's not just taking a desktop site and putting it on a mobile device. I mean, you really have to think through these things, how the user experience is going to happen and how people are going to interact with your site. Um, also, with the mobile web, we now have to worry about battery life. So, we have, with HTML5 and CSS3, we have the capability to access device hardware. So this gives us, at the same time, this gives us great power, but we can also drain the battery life for that user. So we must understand how these, um, how these queries or how the CSS affects the, the, the phone. And when we access, we'll go over later how, um, when you access the geolocation API, how it, it can uh, cause wonky things to happen in iOS. Um, so the code quality. You, now, with your offline first capable clients, you get a single payload. So everything is sent down to the client as one concatenated JavaScript file, minified, and your, your images are in your CSS, and they're all base64 encoded. And so um, you, you want to essentially get everything down and then kind of progressively enhance that as the user progresses. And just basically, basically overall, it's just a lot more focus on the front end. So now that we kind of have a brief overview of the mobile web, we, we have to decide what to support and how we're going to 
how we're going to support these APIs and all these different browsers. And so there's this term called graceful degradation where, you know, you, you develop for like web sockets or whatever, and then it, if, if the phone doesn't support it, it, it gracefully degrades to polling or long polling. So that's, um, that's what we mean by graceful degradation. Um, so when you're spanning all these browsers, it's a huge undertaking. Um, you know, previously, developers didn't care about uh, your desktop device. It was just an unlimited connection, and you could have your files organized however you wanted to, and didn't have to worry about deferring your JavaScript and how it's going to be loaded and the dependencies that go along with that. You just kind of pumped everything out. And you, you didn't care if that desktop computer had an accelerometer on it. Of course it didn't, but, uh, or a camera for that matter. Um, so now we must care about those things. And it adds another dimension of support, too, because we're not just targeting a browser like we used to and operating. So previously we would have what, Windows Vista or uh, Windows XP and IE6 or 7. Now we have the actual phone version, then the operating system version, then the browser. So it's, it's a different matrix of support that... Um, and a lot of people that I've talked to that do uh, development may just go one version back. So right now it's iOS 6 is the current version, so uh, those developers would only go back to iOS 5 for new requests. So um, you really have to figure out what your spectrum of support is going to be for these devices. So let's talk for a minute about mobile, mobile web browsers. Oops. So WebKit has a huge market share right now. It uh, it's powers Android devices and iOS devices, and many others, uh, like the BlackBerry 10 coming up. And it also powers Chrome, so for those Android users that install Chrome, and many, many others. The WebKit kind of exploded, um, as you can see here, as Safari was released, and kind of as the mobile... Uh, revolution started to happen at year six, their uh, contributions or revisions to their code base skyrocketed. And that's pretty powerful for an open source community. And, you know, a lot of that was driven by the vendors as well. Oops. So Mobile Safari has standard hardware, multi-core technology, and GPU access through the HTML5 APIs, which is really ideal um, you can do a lot of really cool CSS3E. I don't know where that came from, sorry. Um, but, yeah, you can do, you know, a lot of powerful things through an iOS device. And it makes programming fun. Like, you can, you can sit there and write HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, test it in Chrome or Safari on your desktop, and then it's pretty much going to work on your, um, on your device or your emulator as well. So uh, that is nice until you switch over to Android and you see that half the things you just wrote do not work. So the default browser is terrible. Um, it's very fragmented between all the vendors. Like if you take the, the Kindle Fire and, and their fork of Android and then you take um, like the Galaxy S2, which is one of the most popular um, devices out there, and you look at how all these different vendors um, implement Android and, and give the operating system access to those um, to the hardware functions themselves, you know, the, it's just a wide open space of fragmentation. So now with Android it being an open platform, you can install any browser you want to. <clears throat> and then, so this is kind of the Android market share right now. And if you see, this is just from last month in October, but um, up at the top you have Gingerbread, which is 2.3, which is, you know, really a pain to, to develop on. It's, it's slowly declining, and then 4.0 is kind of rising. So that's, that's good in a way, considering that you have so, much, um, so many phones out there that are, that are Android devices, and that is a large percentage of your, your user base. So Firefox Mobile, like I said earlier, they're coming out with this Firefox OS, which is, and it's, it was demoed earlier this year on a phone, um, and, and it's basically an HTML5 driven phone. Um, and it's also leading the web API project, which that project goes hand in hand. It, it, it allows us, you know, earlier I was saying how we can't get text messaging 
or the address book from native HTML5 APIs right now. We can't get access to those things, but uh, with this OS, you will be able to. You'll, you, it'll be just like writing a native app for or using HTML5 and, and very um, widely adopted um, standards. So this is uh, Firefox OS, and this is kind of what it looks like. Um, so you can go out, Google Firefox OS, and, and see. I tried to build the emulator before this talk, but it was taking a really long time, so I did not get it done. So next we have Opera Mobile. And Opera Mini has a really large share, or it did, it, it shrank over the past year, um, which we'll see in just a second. But Opera Mini is basically uh, like a proxy. It, it just basically shows you markup, or it shows you what a website looks like, and it goes back to a server to render that, and it spits it back out to you. So there's really no HTML. Even though it has a large percentage of mar market share, there's, there's no HTML5 capabilities in that browser. And then um, Opera Mobile, which is a very nice browser, um, is, ha has the capability to do a lot of the same things that the iOS browser does, that Mobile Safari does. So hopefully it'll gain market share as well. And the, the thing we have to understand is that we want competition. We don't want WebKit to be the 80% the market share holder. We want as many platforms in there as possible, and we want them to support the open standards as best as possible. And, so far, it seems to be kind of coming that way. Um, so with Windows doing a big push, you know, Windows, uh, their new RT tablet was just released, and, and they're doing their whole marketing push right now um, for Windows Phone 8. And that IE10 gives us a lot of good HTML5 API support. So it's really going to be an interesting browser to, uh, to watch out for. And here's the same chart again. Uh, showing uh, in May earlier this year what, what the scene looked like. And now, since, since this time last year, uh, WebKit has jumped from 75 to 87 percent. Um, Opera Mini shrunk from 18 percent to 8 percent. That's a whole 10 points. And then um, IE browsers, both IE and BlackBerry, grew to 1 percent market share. So as you can see, it's this huge fluctuation in just one year's time uh, as to who this browser war is going to belong to. So how do we keep up? So we just went over like five different browsers and these are really the big players. These are the ones, so when you set out to write your application, these are the ones you're going to be writing for more than likely unless you just have a really special edge case that, that you need to cover. So there's this concept called HTML5e that I wrote about, and it's basically saying, you know, what are the building blocks of enterprise applications? So I come from an enterprise background, so that's, that's kind of where this comes. How can we, and, I, and just to tell you a little bit about myself, you know, I, I used to be a heavy JSF developer. I was all about server-side generated UI, and, and now I've just gone the complete opposite way, you know, from GWT, from JSF, from uh, JSPs even. Um, and now, you know, we're going this different way to where all the markups delivered down to the client and there's no dependence on the server. So with that said, you know, when, when I set out to write this, I wanted to understand what, what is most widely supported across all these different browsers. And that's kind of these five APIs. It's geolocation, web sockets, web storage, device orientation, and web workers. And those kind of across all the different browsers <coughs> give you basic building blocks that, that, you can, that you can tackle and that you can build a really, um, really nice uh, application with. So the same thing with, um, with the mobile, mobile browsers. We have mobile Safari, Android, mobile IE, uh, Opera Mobile, and mobile Firefox. And for the most part, these browsers either have mixed coverage, they don't support maybe a few, but they're going to, and, and that's the thing. So we kind of have these, these two different um, balances to work with and, and to, to develop on and, and give us some really nice APIs. So we're going to jump into a demo now. And the, the 
slidfast.js library basically backs this HTML5 e concept and, and is, is what we're going to use for the, for the remainder of the session to, to go over uh, the code. So let's do it. So if you want to follow along, you can. Um, basically what we're going to do is we're going to write a simple mobile web app. Just what, what is the bare minimum required to write a mobile web app? And that's, that's what we're going to do. So let's see here. All right, so this is the address. I guess I could bit.ly that for you guys. Sorry about that. Let me do that. Not moving. Okay, what's another good link shortener? I guess the Wi-Fi is kind of moving slow, so uh, there it goes. Uh, there it is. So if you want to go out to this to this link here, it's bit.ly slash TV UJVD. So if anybody wants to go out there. And what we're going to go over is we're going to go over this, and then we're going to add touch functionality to really give it a native native feel. So this is a basic website that uses hardware acceleration. So it uses CSS3 to accelerate the sliding of the divs and give us a nice flip and sliding transition. That, that's kind of the bare, the bare minimum of what you need to present a mobile, mobile web app. So let's check out the source. So as you can see here, this is our source. The, these are the, the four pages you just saw. You've got the home page, the products page, the about page, and the contact page. And those are just four pages, four divs, and that, that's what we would put our content in or whatever we have to deliver to the client. So that's, that's it for the HTML. It's just four, four or five divs um, and some containers, and that's about it, and then your, your navigation at the top. So if you look at the CSS, you have um, wrong CSS file. You have HTML body, all your basic boilerplate stuff. But the stuff you really care about care about are these vendor prefixes here. So actually, let me open this up. ID be better. See that? Yep. All right. So we have our basic kind of setup for this mobile web app. And all we're doing here is, is we're saying that a page, you know, width, height, width and height at 100%, um, we're, we've got some basic utilities. Um, the transition that, that sets up that page is, is, are these four lines. And if you notice them, I don't know if you're familiar with vendor prefixes, but you've got Moz, WebKit, and O. And this, this is to support the Mozilla web browser, the WebKit, and then the Opera 
web browser as well. So let's let's um, go down and look at these. So this this CSS is all that all that is required to do the flip transition. So when I did this guy right here. So when the page flips, 360 degree flip, it's all that's required to do that is this CSS here, which really isn't that terrible. Um, and that's, that's pretty much it. Uh, the, the pages, these are kind of the classes that hide the pages. But as you can see, 100 lines of CSS, a few divs, um, and then the, the JavaScript that goes along with that, which we'll look at now. So the slide to function, when the pages slide back and forth, all we're doing is we're um, taking the class name and swapping it out. And, and when you swap the classes out, and just basic DOM access, and you replace the class, It'll take that transition and move the page to the to the appropriate uh, spot. So let's see. Um, so if we look at where is that? Yeah. So this class here, the page, and then stage right and stage left. So all I'm doing is saying stage, or removing those classes, or saying stage center, or whatever, and it just brings those pages into focus. So it's really, really basic, but you know, just starting from the basis here, and then we'll progress and get into more advanced stuff. But I want you guys to understand, this is a basic app, and it works, um, works fine on, on mobile devices. Let me actually pull that up. So iOS simulator, and everything's cool. OK, so that is that. Let me pull it up on uh, Safari as, or Opera Mobile as well. So Opera Mobile has a really nice emulator. They, um, they'll give you a lot of different devices to choose from. I don't know if anyone in here has used the Android emulator, but it is god awful slow. So um, this this is nice. So you can kind of pick. We'll do the Evo 4G. We'll launch it. That's right there. We'll paste that in, and now we have tested across two different browsers at this point. And we could do the uh, Firefox browser as well. And that's, that's what's involved. This is just the very basics of what is involved when you're doing a mobile web application and you want to target all these different browsers. You have to open up the emulators for all your targets and then test in all those. So it can be quite fun and painful at times. OK. So the next thing we're going to look at is, is touch functionality. So how? So that's great. Slides across the page. Yeah. So what else? What else can we do here? So we're going to take. Um, So we're going to take this page and slide it at this point. So my mouse here is emulating slide function or touch functionality. And I mean, that seems pretty native, right? It's, this emulator is actually a little more uh, jagged than a than, uh, native device would be. So as, as we slide over, it goes to the next page. And as we slide back, it goes back. So the, the flip functionality is, is, is all that's really required there. Um, so let's look at the code. How, how did we make that happen? So this gets a little more uh, complex as well. 
Um, let's see here. All right, so our touch page, it's basically the same exact thing I just showed you. Four divs, everything's the same. Um, with the with the library or the, this little slip slip fast framework, it's it just says touch enable. And by the way, the slip fast thing is really not made for public consumption. I mean, it is. It's really a learning framework. It's it's used heavily in the book, um, but I'm not trying to write another JavaScript framework because God knows we've got enough of those out there. So this is basically it's it's very well commented, um, and everything I'm talking about today, you can go back look at the it's it's on GitHub actually. We'll pull that up in a minute. Um, but you can go back and look at it and see exactly how I did these things. So let's take a look at the touch functionality. So here you can see that we have this touch function. And what it does is it basically detects the event type. So whether it's a touch in or touch start, and then it goes on through to figure out if we're canceling the swipe event by, it actually measures where your finger is on the page. So, you know, some people kind of touch and then slide over and then they'll slide it back, not really wanting to slide, do the actual navigation. So this detects that with some very simple code uh, right here. And then <clears throat> we go on down to, um, to complete to either slide left or slide right. And that's pretty much it. Um, the biggest the biggest point uh, to sliding is the WebKit CSS3 matrix. Yeah, this guy right here. We can enlarge the font here. Can you guys see that okay, or do I need to enlarge it back there? You okay? All right. Um, so this WebKit CSS matrix gives you the actual uh, matrix of the um, of the transition that that we're causing to happen, and that's actually um, it's kind of complicated. Uh, but basically, it tells us on the on the um, x-axis where our finger is, and so that it can follow us on on the device. So when we're doing this right here, if I were to actually let's do this. emulate the touch event. on. Okay, well, I'm not publishing something correctly here. Mm -hmm. Ah, thank you. It's very deceiving. Uh, 
this is not easy to work in. You got to be kidding me. Just done that from the beginning. Yeah, so as you can see, when I go down through here, all these log statements grow as I move my finger across the screen. So it's just giving us the x axis of that CSS matrix. And so that is what allows for the native feel of the transition. So without that, you're not going to get this cool, nice slide effect with, with a touch. Okay. So let's see, what else? At the end, we do the slide. And that's pretty much it. Um, so it's just some CSS manipulation, a little bit of JavaScript to get that basic functionality. That gives us our native mobile, mobile web app, right? Okay, so let's get back to slides here. Not that one. Okay. So that gave us single web, uh, single page mobile web app. And the single page thing is where, like you saw, all the divs are kind of in a single page. And, and in a minute, we'll go out and we'll show how to prefetch content to deliver to those pages to make it even a more advanced single page app. So we added touch support. Um, CSS, HTML, around 300 lines, and we tested that across all the browsers that we could test for in the time allotted here. So that's the basics of a mobile web app. That's what's involved. Um, so what did we learn? We learned that you don't need jQuery Mobile or another wrapper framework. I actually reviewed the top five uh, frameworks, um, the top five mobile web frameworks and JQ Touch, jQuery Mobile, those are kind of what I just showed you, single page application where you bring in the resources and, and you kind of use their skin and it's got the nice rounded corners, the nice gradients. But as you become a, a hardened mobile web developer, you'll see that, that those cost, cost your, your user battery life, they cost processing time, uh, because every time that that gradient has to be generated, every time that rounded corner has to be generated, it uses the uh, CPU and the GPU. So uh, basically what's recommended, uh, and one site that I mention a lot is, is LinkedIn has a really, really nice mobile website. It's really fast, really responsive, really zippy. And um, if you go to LinkedIn.com through your mobile device, you'll see that it really performs well. Uh, and, and the reason for that is, and if you look at the corners uh, and the gradients, they don't have any. And anything that they do use is going to be base 64 or brought down as a sprite for that particular uh, application. So, um, so yeah, so we've got the jQuery mobile kind of thing, which is it's a great, you know, getting started uh, framework. And then you'll find that you can do this, as I just showed you, with 300 lines of code, roughly. And, you know, and, and you have to do that because... There's many other developers that work for many other, you know, top-notch companies that come and speak at conferences like this, and they go through all these, these pains that they had to work through on, on the fragmentation of Android 
to um, not using transitions and not using, not activating the DOM. And, and so there's so many things with the mo mobile web. So it's not right once run anywhere yet. I mean, it, it's, you know, we're trying to get there, but you have to have different shims and polyfills uh, for the different browsers. Vendor prefixes, as you saw earlier in the code. Um, let's see. So these guys right here. Having to declare the same CSS line, backface visibility, backface visibility, and backface visibility, for all the three different Mozilla, Opera, and WebKit, it's, it's a really big hassle. So they're, these are trying to go away, but they're not away yet, and, and you're going to have to support them for a while. So every platform you support, you have to understand what, what is allowed on it. Like for Android, um, or let's just say for iOS, this line right here, Mobile Safari, this WebKit transform, translate 3D, that will activate the GPU. That's what turns the GPU on, so you can have these nice, very nice native feel uh, animation transitions and all this good stuff. But it won't work in Android or Firefox because they only support Translate 2D. They don't have the 3D matrix there yet. So um, that's, those are the kind of things that you, you'll understand as you go along developing. So older iPhones, any device which hasn't been upgraded past Android 4, are going to be the i6s of this mobile era. All the 2.3 Android devices, um, all the devices that have been forked, um, all these things are going to be a huge pain in our side for a while. Um, as you can see, 50% market share for Android 2.3. That's, that's pretty large. So, all right. So we are at 220, roughly. Um, we'll wait. Okay. So hour two. So, um, Let's talk about offline capability first. So online offline events. So we have this add event listener, and this, this allows us to detect on the phone when it goes on or offline. I'll actually show you here. So let's pull up. This. So this same the same app I just showed you, um, and now we're just going to take this offline. And now, when I go to access a link, it says this app is currently offline and cannot access the hotness. That is not a standard message that you would get. So when we bring our uh, device back online, so I'm going to enable the Wi-Fi now you'll see that I hope I can get back on the Wi-Fi okay so we'll let that come back online but anyway when it does come online and I click on that link it's going to take me directly to the page because my JavaScript kite my heavy JavaScript client as it went offline it used that event listener and it said okay behind the scenes without you even seeing it. When I disable the Wi-Fi connection, there it is. So, um, so now you go to the About Us page. So that, um, you didn't see any alerts, anything didn't pop up, it just all kind of happened. And so now let's go over the code that, that, that showed us, that allowed us to do that. So these event listeners fire in the browser like for uh, I did this in Chrome, but it works in iOS, uh, mobile Safari, and Android. And it's and it basically an event that you listen for. And so that's what allowed us to process that offline functionality. And we'll go, I'll step through the code line by line in just a second. So this also gives us, with this offline um, support, we can also detect the network type that we're on mainly on Android devices right now. I wish, I wish the folks at Apple would hurry up and get this feature onto, their, onto mobile Safari, but right now for Android, you can say, okay, if my connection dot type, you can get the navigator dot connection up here, which is default API, 
And you can say if it's a type equals three, that, that way we'll know we're on an edge network. Um, and if type equals two, we're on uh, AT&T. This, this allows you to get a feel for what kind of latency they're going to be facing, uh, what the download speeds are. And this way you can deliver the right kind of content to that, to that device on that type of network. So um, let's go here. So the app cache, so we've gone over online offline events, network detection, and the app cache. And, and that demo I just showed you, will, it goes through all these things. But I just want to touch, touch base with them real quick. So the app cache, for those that you don't know, that allows up to 5 to 10 megabytes on the phone of data or markup to be stored. And it's really a pain to work with. It's, and it's been noted in quite a few articles on the web recently through the past couple of years. Um, but it's, it's what we have to work with. It's, it, it can be worked with, and you can use it to create an offline capable app because it's all you have across all these devices. So um, we'll go back through that in just a sec. So this is what an app cache config looks like, and it basically just says, you know, here's my manifest. The, the comment at the top here is very important because each time you change this file, you must rev this file, the comment, or some particular part of it. And then you have, you tell it what you want to cache, and then you tell it network star. So what does network star mean? This basically indicates that the browser should allow all connections to non-cached resources. So if you have a picture of a cat on a page that you've cached, it's not going to bring that resource through. And that, so the network star allows that because you didn't cache um, that image previously. And then we'll get into link prefetching. So let me, let me just kind of stop right here, and I'll go through each one in the code because that's a lot to remember. So let's go through online offline events. OK, so this ad event listener waits for the load event. So it waits for you to actually bring the site up in your, in your browser. And when that happens, we're going to either say if it's online, we're going to process our online function, else it's offline, and the app has already been cached or it may be bookmarked or something. So um, we go through here, we go listen for offline and online. So these three functions kind of listen for the three cases. One is the loading of the site, the initial loading, and the other two are when it goes offline after it's loaded or when it goes, comes back online after it's loaded. So you have these three different scenarios for an offline application. Okay. And then here's the setup, and it, this is what I just showed you to where you have all these different um, connection types. So you can detect Wi-Fi, Edge, 3G, or unknown. And those, the way that I approached this was, you know, if a user's on a really crappy network and it really is slow, then let's load all the resources synchronously instead of asynchronously so we don't choke the connection. And so that was kind of the, that's what the true and false are for here, is to load it, to load all the resources asynchronously or synchronously. And then... So our process online event, we go through and we check the app cache for um, have there been any updates. So when, the, when it comes back online, and this is kind of the, these are all the, the points that you have to go through when you're um, developing an offline app. So we've gone through the, the first three scenarios. Now we're going to check the app cache to see if there's an update ready. And if there is, we're going we're gonna to tell the user that a new version of the site is available. This is where it's really hard to work with the app cache because you can't just go out and check these things behind the scenes. They actually have to reload the page to get the new updates. So we call window.location reload. This is the most elegant way you have to work with the app cache. This is, this is how you have to do it with an offline capable app. And then so that was online. And then when we go offline, 
all we're doing, that, that alert message you saw earlier where it said this, this app cannot access the hotness, that is just a, um, a function that we're appending to those links on click so they can't actually go out to those links. So we can actually handle that case where it falls offline and we can go through behind the scenes and manipulate content, do whatever, and, and really have a nice user experience for offline capable apps. Okay, so that, let's see, so now we'll go back. So that was our online, offline, network detection, app cache, app cache config. So let me show you the app cache here. So, got our page, it works great, we can go offline. Now, we should see that same message, yep. Okay, so, let's go back here, view page source. Up here at the top, you see this manifest demo.appcache. That is where our app cache lives, and once the browser sees this, it's going to go out and take a look and see what all you want to cache. Those are the things we want to cache. Um, the app cache file has to be served up with, a, with the app cache MIME type, so that's why it's running on this uh, app spot on the Google App Engine because I was able to throw it up quickly and get that MIME type to serve this file up. Um, and, and so that's, there's basically two MIME types in the HTML5 spec. One is for this and the other one is for the iframe, uh, the sandbox iframe, which I'll go over in just a minute. So yeah, so that's it. And that caches all these resources, and now this app can go offline. So if you were to go to this URL here in your, um, on your mobile device, you can bookmark it on the iOS device. You can go offline. You can pull it up anytime and go through it, and it's basically that easy. So these, again, everything I'm doing here is the bare minimum. What does it take to have a mobile web app? What does it take to make it touch capable? What does it take to make it offline capable? There's no extra frills here. There's no extra frameworks. It's all core APIs so that you as a developer can understand that. And once you understand these things, then you can bring in the frameworks that, that help you conquer the, the huge fragmentation area and, and allows you to, to work better. Because frameworks do allow us to work better, but you know, you, it's good to have a, a fundamental understanding of these APIs and how to work with them, especially if you want to contribute back to open source. Um, so, all right. Okay, and then last thing is going to be link prefetching. So since the early days of like Firefox 3, I think even IE4, they had this ability to prefetch URLs and to go out and fetch them behind the scenes. Now, this for re recent times for mobile, this is great because all these links you see on this page here are prefetched. So that one actually is not. But when you go out to like this one, that one's not either. <laughs> all right. So let's do. So this, when, when I click on this link here, it, it actually is an external page. But it's, it has that nice native feel to it. Because that's, that's one huge thing about the mobile web. You've got this site, and it's got a ton of links and all this content. It's a huge enterprise application, whatever. It could be CNN.com. It doesn't matter. Um, you're going to have things that you want to link to, but you want it to appear as if it's a native app or a mobile web app. And that's where link prefetching comes in as it goes out when that user loads the page and when, when, when 
they're idle or when you have the ability, you go out and fetch everything else and bring it in so that when they click that link, it, um, everything is seamless. So that's what we had the ability to do in older browsers, um, but now we have even better ways of handling this. Um, and I don't know if it's part of the HTML5 spec, link prefetching. It, it said in, in some of the things I read it was, but um, I couldn't find much on it in the spec itself. So I know it's been around for a while. So I didn't know this existed when I wrote the demo app, um, which is a, it's fine because this is actually in some, some ways better because we actually do use HTML5. So with HTML5 came this new thing called a sandboxed iframe. And this basically allows you to load unsafe content into an iframe and it does not execute any scripts. It doesn't have any, it, it cannot maliciously affect your site in any way. And this kind of gave me a chance to, to go through and, and say how can we load, how can we go out and prefetch this content and bring it in without having to write a JavaScript parser to parse all this HTML and insert it into the DOM um, when we could just use an iframe and let, let the browser do the work, let the browser parse all this markup. Because um, the same guy that wrote jQuery, John Rezig, also has a, um, a library that will parse HTML and bring it into the DOM. And it's like three or 400 lines of JavaScript. And we can do it in like 10. So um, let's let the iframe handle it. And then when the iframe gets that content loaded, we can call um, document.getElementById, append child, adopt node, new page. And that brings our new page in. So let's go through the code and I'll show you exactly how this works. Oh yeah, by the way, so this is out on JSPerf. So the whole reason I started researching this was because inner HTML was broken on um, iOS 3.0. 3.x devices. It was actually, there was this crazy thing to where inner HTML, when you go out and do an Ajax call, the, the, it would just not bring the Ajax into the page. And there's multiple blog posts about it out there. And I was, you know, I wanted a way around inner HTML. How, 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 how else can we bring content into the page without really causing a big issue? So this sandbox iframe approach, <coughs> is actually faster than inner HTML in some cases. So the red is inner HTML. So the bigger it is, the better. Um, but as you can see, the blue, uh, especially down at the bottom, it's hard to read, but that's iPhone and iPad. Um, but the blue is outperforming inner HTML. So there's really some uh, interesting things going on with uh, using this approach instead of inner HTML. So let's, let's look at that, then we'll take a quick break. All right, so here's the link right here, and it has a class of fetch on it. So any link that has fetch will go out and fetch the content. And then we'll look at the code. Yeah, so um, we're going to go in here and basically insert the new page is kind of all we care about. I mean, we're defining some variables here and we're getting uh, different things, uh, but insert page is what we want. So when we go in and there it is. So we're going to go through get elements by class name, and we are going to go through here. We're going to get the get the page, yeah, frame dot right. So we get the frame here. So we're going to get a new iframe, a new sandbox iframe, and then we're going to go back up here, and we're going to write the text to it that we got from our Ajax call. So we're going to um, basically go out, make an Ajax call to the page, bring in all the markup, and then write it here into our iframe. And now we have parsed that DOM successfully. 
And then we go through and bring these incoming pages in so that we know where to link to them. And um, here we append that page to the document. So let's look at the source as to how that works. So there's the iframe, and then our homepage detail. This, see, originally we only had three uh, divs, homepage, product page, and about page. Now we have homepage detail and product page detail, and those were created on the fly using that, I, that sandbox iframe approach. And that is about, about it. So now, before we take a quick break, um, we've gone over... Basic app, native feel, offline capability, and prefetching content. So this kind of gives us, and handling on and offline events. So that kind of gives us a base, basic web application to now go and investigate the uh, HTML5 APIs like geolocation, web workers, WebSocket. I've got some really cool demos uh, for you guys when you come back. So I will see you back here in what, 10 minutes you guys do typically? 10 minutes you need to take a break.